praise the Lord and a happy new year to us all. Let us pray. Be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. Thanks, Lord Jesus, for bringing us to the beginning of this year. We thank you for all that you have done for us in the years that are past. We commit ourselves to you once again. May everything we say and think and do bring glory to your name. Help us to walk with you this year, even as you are very eager to walk with us. And with our hands in your mighty hands, we know that you will tackle everything that comes against us. Thank you for the, your blessing. Amen. As was explained to us last week, our annual theme is changing times and changing truths. Changing times and changing truths. We live in a world that is rapidly changing. But for us as Christians, there are certain basic truths, foundational truths on which we have pledged our lives, on which we have based our lives, and these give us stability and help us to work out our bearings so we do not lose our way in this moral jungle of the 21st century, changing times and changing truths. So we will look at lessons from the Psalms. Last week we looked at Psalm 1, and Reverend Crimson outlined some lessons about the person God blesses, drawing contrast between the righteous and the wicked or sinners. Today, in the second of the series, we look at Psalm 2, under the topic, Amidst the Turmoil, Our Lord is Supreme. I miss the turmoil, our Lord is supreme. Psalm 1 focus, focuses on the people who love the law of the Lord, while Psalm 2 focuses on the people who defy the law of the Lord. And you will not find Psalm 1 quoted in the New Testament, but Psalm 2 is quoted about 18 times. It is quoted in the New Testament more than any other psalm. During the Advent season, we looked at sermons showing how various personalities reacted to the birth of Christ our Savior. Now the hostility of a high and powerful person like King Herod gave a chilling sense of foreboding about how this newborn king would be received by the people of the world. Now Psalm 2 is among the Psalms called the Royal Psalms. And on the surface, it is about the coronation of a king in Israel. Because God was Israel's ultimate king, the kings considered themselves anointed by God, and indeed, they were anointed. So, Psalm 2 speaks of the crowning of a king in Israel, perhaps King David. And this king was crowned much to the annoyance of his enemies. A more popular royal psalm is Psalm 45. Psalm 2 is also known as the Messianic Psalm, one of the Messianic Psalms, because it is one of the 12 Psalms that speak of Jesus and his rule as an everlasting king. We want to look at the turmoil of the nations 
and we want to establish from the word of God the supremacy of God and of his anointed. But let me share with you a story that establishes one of the points I want to make. In his world acclaimed book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, the author, Stephen Covey, writes of an episode that I found very appropriate. He talks about some battleships doing some military maneuvers on the sea. And as night fell, the visibility was poor. So there was one person who was on one of the battleships as the lookout, just uh, making sure everything was okay, looking out for other ships that may be getting close. At one time, the lookout signaled to the captain of the ship that it looks like some light was heading towards them. So they asked, uh, the captain verified it, and he said, it seems like we are on a collision course with this um, light, which seems like a ship. So the captain called the signal man to signal to the ship that it was on a collision course with, with it and that it should change course 20 degrees. The signal came back, advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. The captain said to him, told the signal man, now signal him, I am a captain, change course 20 degrees. The response came, I am a seaman, second class. You had better change course 20 degrees. Now, you know, the military is very hierarchical. A captain is way up there. A second class seaman is way down there. So when the captain heard this, he was furious. So he said, he told the signal man, send, I am a battleship change course 20 degrees. The response came, I am a lighthouse. Immediately, the battleship changed course. You see, the Lord and his anointed can be likened to the lighthouse, solid, immovable, permanent. While the people of the world can be likened to the battleship, they are taken up by their appearances, their size, their technological advancement, their titles and position. And from where they sit, they think they control everything and that everybody else is inferior to them. They tend to be self-referencing. But we want to look at the supremacy of God. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42, 5 to 8 says this. This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk in it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. <coughs> Verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Let's look again at Isaiah 43, 10 to 13. Isaiah 43, 10 to 13. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no savior. I have redeemed and saved and proclaimed, I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? And so the prophet talks elsewhere 
about the fact that God is the one who sits about the circle of the earth and all its inhabitants are like grasshoppers before him. About the anointed of the Lord, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, talking about the supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Hebrews chapter 1 also talks about the fact that Christ is higher than any angel because his name is superior than the name given to any angel. He is the begotten and anointed son of God and when he had finished the, with the purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty. Hallelujah. So let's go back to Psalm 2 and pick out a few lessons. The people of the world want nothing to do with God and his anointed one. So they conspire and say, let's get God out of the picture. They plot and they plan. And they said, let's break the chains and throw off their fetters. They don't want to have anything to do with God. The fact is that God has not bound humanity with chains or fetters. But the rulers of the world, because they hate God, they don't want anything to do with his rule. They don't want any commandments, any restrictions. They want life without any rules, at least not rules from God. They want to make their own rules. This is what the people of the world call freedom. But it is in fact license, a life without boundaries. They don't want God or anybody to hold them accountable. But God in his wisdom ordained that everything he has created must be under some authority. Nobody is completely autonomous. Whether the person calls himself in a can or a home, you know, like, <laughs> I am who I am, if you like. Everything in creation must be under authority, especially human beings who are the apex of God's creation. Else, that person gets out of control and becomes like a loose cannon or a raging animal. One British theologian called P.T. Forsyth once wrote, the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. The first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. In 1977, when some of us were second year going to third year, undergrads here, got to a time when the, <coughs> excuse me, the country was in turmoil. It was under the military rule of General Kutu Achampo. And there was perceived corruption and prices of things were going up and um, <coughs> Basic groceries were getting short. So the university students, all you know, three universities at the time, they just stayed, didn't go to lectures, criticized the government, ate and slept. And in the midst of all that, the government sent, um, and there were some BNI people who came to spy what was happening. And one evening, the students got, saw a man whom they thought was not, um, didn't look like a student. So they asked him, Charlie, where are you, which hall? Which room? And the room the person, the person said was from Commonwealth Hall. The room he mentioned was the number for a pantry. And they realized that uh -uh, this man, he's not one of us. So they tried to grab him and he escaped. But they saw the car with which he came. They drained the petrol out, rolled the car between Legon Hall, religions department, and set it alight. 
it was, you know, so we saw the car red with, you know, I mean, the, the sky red with the smoke and the flame, and it was tragic. In the midst of that, of that the Ghana Fellowship of Evangelical Students, GAFIS, invited one of the foremost theologians of the 20th century, Reverend Dr. John Stott, to come and speak to the students and hold a crusade here and so on. So that evening, the day after, Reverend Stott gave us a short exposition about freedom that I tried to share with you. At that time, students had a lot of you know, tanks filled with goldfish, you know, aquariums we call them. And he spoke about freedom and he said, every man must be under authority. And he said, fish, the gills of a fish are designed to breathe the oxygen in water, not the oxygen in the atmosphere. So a fish's natural environment is the water. So the day a fish would, you know, imagine it says, I am tired of being confined to this aquarium, being cold and slimy, I want to be free. And then it wriggles itself out of the, of the water. That act is not an act of freedom, it is suicide. And if you are first year in this university, please pay attention to this. There will be no rising bell, nobody will tell you what to do. You can go to lectures if you like. But freedom without boundaries is licentiousness. It's not freedom at all. So the nations and the rulers are not against God in an abstract way. They are particularly against his anointed one. The word Messiah in Hebrew means the anointed one. And in Greek, it is Christos, which is translated Christ. The person and the name of Christ is offensive to them. The last time we spoke about somebody being angry that there was a doll in the manger signifying Christ. So the rulers gather, they prepare for war as it were. And they want to see God out, out of their lives. If you want a picture of God, a world without God, read Romans chapter 1 from verse 18 down. That could be your assignment for today. Romans 1, 18 to the end of the chapter. Man without God, and it's not a very pretty picture. So when humanity sees God's rule as chains and seeks to throw them off, Psalm 2 says God laughs. He's amused. He mocks their vain and futile reasoning and efforts. You know, like the man who was at the lighthouse, he knew the commands of the captain of the battleship would go nowhere. God sees them as a drop in a bucket. And Isaiah 40 verse 6 says, All men are like grass and their glory like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but he who does the will of the Lord abides forever. It was God and it is God who installed Christ the king and not humans who voted him into power. He says, I have installed my king on my holy hill. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. And then the anointed one says, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Jesus is the everlasting king. Like the stone that was thrown at the huge statue that Daniel saw in his dream, that the king of Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, the stone became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. And when the Bible says in verse 9, you will rule them with an iron scepter, you will dash them to pieces like pottery, it's not saying that the rule of Jesus on this earth will be oppressive. No. And that Jesus' rule will be harsh. What he's saying is that he will establish his rule and those who hate law and order will find his rule harsh. The Lord will establish, and not only establish, he will enforce righteousness 
and lawbreakers and rebels will feel oppressed, just like armed robbers find the police a great nuisance and a great pay. So the Lord spoke to the rulers and those in authority to stop fighting his anointed and to repent and serve him. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Psalm 2, verse 10. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So the Lord is saying that this is the time of grace. This is the time of salvation. So the kings of the earth should submit to the authority of God before they are made to do so. They should kiss the anointed one. In those days, you kiss the hand of a king as a sign of allegiance, as a sign of submission to his authority. And this is the time of grace in which we are living. The Lord is making his appeal to all of us through believers, through evangelists, through missionaries. But the period of grace will not last forever. As the seaman second class on the lighthouse said, they had better change course. Friends in Christ, when we have faith in God, it clarifies our thinking and gives us insight into situations as they really are. If we may go back to our first analogy, the captain of the battleship assumed the light from the lighthouse was moving towards the ship, but it was rather the battleship that was moving towards the lighthouse. Light, lighthouses are installed in areas where the land juts into the sea, and the place is rocky. And it warns ships not to get any closer unless they will run aground. So people are telling the lighthouse, telling God, get out of our way. C.S. Lewis once said, it is people who live in the light who can see both light and darkness. People who live in darkness don't see anything at all. So God is telling humanity, it is time for humanity to change course. This time, not 20 degrees, but 180 degrees to accept the Savior, the anointed one, before his anger flares up against them. Now let's fast forward to the New Testament reading. The contest is that Peter and John had healed a crippled man in the name of Jesus, and that got them into big trouble with the authorities. It was not the healing per se that annoyed the authorities. It was the healing in the name of Jesus. That's what upsets them. So the conspiracy we saw from the rulers in Psalm 2 actually began from the Garden of Eden through the rebellion. And then came through the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. Let us make a name for ourselves. And down the ages, generations have defied God and sought to overthrow his rule in the world. The messengers, the prophets, the priests, the saints, and then the ultimate servant, Jesus himself, suffered persecution and death because they said, we do not want this man to rule over us. So in every generation, the fight between good and evil has been waged. The apostles Peter and John were warned not to teach in his name again. And what the authorities were saying, in fact, forget about everything he has said. They were to forget about the Great Commission and everything. Wait for the power, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. They wanted none of that. What was the response of the apostles? Acts chapter 4. They prayed, first of all. They prayed acknowledging the sovereignty of God. When they heard this, verse 24, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them. And then this is where we learned that Psalm 2 was penned by David. And they quote the verses in Psalm 2. Generations have suffered the same thing before them. And they saw the threat as a call to action, not something to retreat and go and hide in a corner and shake. So as the hymn says, their courage rose with the danger they faced. 
Let us take a look at the prayer. Usually when you and I are in trouble, our first reaction is self-preservation. What do I do? How do I avoid this trouble coming and so on? We pray for safety. And in contemporary times, many Christians see a demon under every chair. And so we begin to pray, sending things back to the sender and so on. And we sometimes curse our perceived and real enemies and adversaries. Something Jesus has warned us not to do. He says, pray for those who persecute you. So the disciples raised their voices together to prayer. They acknowledge in prayer, they acknowledge the sovereignty of God. And verse 29, they, they, verse 27, they talked about their enemies. Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of Israel conspired against Jesus. And he said, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to pick your, speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They asked for courage because they saw their mission and they wanted to finish it. They didn't ask God to take their enemies out of the way because later on we heard that many of the priests became adherents to the faith. They pray that miracles will continue in the name of Jesus. The name that the world finds offensive is the only name they knew and is the only name we know. And it is that name that works wonders, brings healing and wholeness, and brings clarity to a world that is confused and lost. It was true in the time of the apostles. It is still true in our time, the name of Jesus. Friends in Christ, this prayer was prayed 21 centuries ago and Christianity has not died out. The prayer and the power that shook the room where they prayed, the Holy Spirit who emboldened them to preach is still available for us in these times. The attack on Jesus and his followers have continued to our day and all indications are that the attacks will intensify. People don't want God in their public space at all. In some countries, God has been taken out of the classroom. The separation of church and state, the original meaning of it was that the state was not to make any law that would curtail the worship, the activities of the church. Now, over the years, it has been translated to mean that the church should have nothing to the state, with the state and vice versa. There should be a clear line. One should not influence the other. That was not the original meaning. And so we hear of persecutions. We hear of jihadists entering churches in Burkina Faso or Mali and slaughtering worshippers. They burn the churches. And some of the strife that we hear is just persecution under disguise. Recently, I read about a nurse in the UK who was fired from her job because she wore a cross as a pendant on a necklace. Not a huge cross. She was warned not to do that. And she was like, the Sikhs wear their turban, and the Muslim women wear the hijab. These are all religious symbols. So what has this little cross to know? And here she's fighting the case. The attack is to remove God and Christ from the public space. But the subject of our sermon is amidst the turmoil, our Lord is supreme. Hallelujah. So you and I in our prayer, we should prepare for battle. It will come very subtly and then the battle lines will be drawn more and more clearly. But as the song says, now the years have come and the years have gone, but the cause of Jesus still goes on. And our time has come to count the cost to reject this world and choose the cross. So one by one, let us live our lives for the one who died to give us life. Till the trumpet sounds on the final day. So until Christ comes or until he calls us home, you and I 
must make up our minds that we will continue to pledge allegiance to the Lamb. We will not be intimidated because our Lord is supreme. And so God knows why he placed you and I in these end times. To preach the gospel of the anointed one, to bear witness to his saving power until our time comes. May the Lord, the power that em who emboldened the apostles, do the same for us in this generation. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we bless you for the mission you have given us. Thank you that there is no power, there is no strategy, there is no authority that can prevail against you. No principality, no power, because you are the first and at the last, you are still the same. And so help us to hold on to this and to know that as we go through this year, as we spend the rest of our lives here in these end times, you will never, ever forsake us. Because you said, I am with you until the end of the age. Your name is faithful and true. And we put our whole weight on you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And thank you for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. We appreciate you joining our service today. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking on the logo and don't forget to like and share. See you next week. God bless you.